there is only one way to fight deflation, and that is with inflation. There's only one way to fight inflation, and that is with deflation. And so they were able to mm, balance that more when we had more purchasing power. But I have yet to meet anybody, and I, I talked to some quite brilliant people, and I've yet to talk to anybody that can tell me what happens when we get to zero. Zhang begins her discussion by revealing her conviction that the global financial system fundamentally broke in 2008. In that year, the world's central banks were forced into an unprecedented position, using their only remaining tools money printing and manipulating interest rates. These tactics were meant to inspire more borrowing and economic activity, but Zhang stresses that this only encouraged a staggering amount of new debt, compounding an already unsustainable situation. She compares the financial system's current state to the experience of an individual deeply in debt. For example, imagine having a credit card where you're only paying the minimum balance, and part of the interest is being added back to your debt. As the interest compounds, you're not only paying interest on your original balance, but also on the added interest. It's a vicious cycle that seems impossible to break, and it's exactly what's happening on a global scale with government and corporate debt. In 2009, when the US government's debt was $13 trillion, Zhang saw the danger ahead. Now, as debt has ballooned to over $36 trillion, a figure that underscores the severity of the issue. What's worse is that much of this debt is simply compounding interest, making it increasingly difficult if not impossible to pay off. As debt grows, governments, corporations, and individuals are forced to spend more and more on interest payments, leaving less money for essential goods and services. According to Zhang, this is a clear indication that the financial system is on the brink of collapse. One of the critical indicators Zhang discusses is the inversion of the yield curve, particularly the two-year and 10-year bond yields. When short-term bonds offer higher interest rates than long-term bonds, it's a signal that something is fundamentally wrong in the economy. Historically, every time the yield curve has inverted, a recession has followed. And today, we are witnessing the longest yield curve inversion in history, surpassing even the turbulent transition of the 1970s and 1980s when the world shifted from a gold-backed system to a debt-based system. Now we'll show you the best clips of the latest interview. But first hit the like button, smash the subscribe button and turn on notifications so you do not miss out our daily recaps. In 2008, I was 100% convinced that the system died. And so that's when I started doing a lot of my prepping other than gold and silver, which is sound money, because the only tools left for the Fed or any central bank is money printing and interest rates that are supposed to inspire even more debt than governments, corporations, or individuals have already taken on. And that's huge because they keep telling us that it's not sustainable. Well, it hasn't been sustainable in a really long time because what we're actually doing is compounding interest. And when you start to compound interest, if you take it to, again, to an individual level, if you have a credit card, and you make a minimum payment and you're only paying part of the interest, the rest of that interest goes into the principal and now you're paying interest on that interest. And when I looked at that, you know, way back in 2009, when we were $13 trillion in reported debt in the US, now what, have we hit 36 trillion yet that they're talking about? But at that time, we were running, that was the first really big deficit that we were running, roughly a trillion dollars. And I thought to myself, well, if we're only running a trillion dollar deficit and we haven't really been doing it that long, again, go back to the Fred, you can look at that. Why are we servicing $13 trillion in debt? But one of the good features of the FRED is you can go behind it and look at the data. You can look at all the spreadsheets. And that's when I saw that we started compounding. Most of that 13 trillion was compounding interest. If you personally are compounding interest on your credit cards, are you ever getting out of debt? 
Oh, obviously adding more debt, more and more debt, which becomes unsustainable. Not only that, but you're leeching the ability to continue to spend. Because if you're having to spend on the interest, that's less money you have to spend on other things that you might need. And so this is all an indication that we're at the end, but we're so close to that zero, what's going to push us there? The loss of confidence. Again, if you pull up the two and 10 year spread, you will notice that when a yield curve inverts and that what that really means is that the, the shorter duration bonds are paying more than the higher duration bonds, which is illogical, right? Why would you loan the money for a longer term to get paid even less? So we've just been in the longest inversion in history. The, the other time, and it wasn't as long as this, was back in the 70s and 80s when we were transitioning from a gold at least a quasi gold back system into a pure debt based system. So that in and of itself in this little life cycle piece is clearly an indication. But when you look at the graphs and the charts, what you see is that it starts to disinvert and then you go into a recession. And I'm talking about an official recession because some would argue that we were already in one. And I would be on that camp, but the government gets to choose, oh, this is actually a recession. But you can see that data and it's happened other than the, the other really long inversion when we were making that transition back in the 70s and 80s. Every single time. Plus, we had the sham rule, which also indicated a recession was happening. And so we've gotten there's not just one indicator, there's a whole litany of indicators of, of why I know we're going into a recession. There's, there's multiple ones. There's less that I see. I don't see any that doesn't say we're going into a recession, honestly. And neither does Wall Street. This isn't just me saying it. You know, you can read the news, the headlines, and you can see even Wall Street is saying that. I think it was, um, it might have been Morgan Stanley or one of those guys just recently came out and said that all of their indicators between stocks and bonds, that diversion that was happening there was an indication of a near recession. A key metric that Zhang watches closely is the velocity of money, the rate at which money changes hands within the economy. A significant spike in this number can be an early warning sign of hyperinflation. Zhang notes that while we haven't yet seen hyperinflation fully take hold, she firmly believes we are already on the path toward it. In her view, the Federal Reserve's only options are to lower interest rates and print more money, which will inevitably lead to higher inflation. As inflation spikes, the public will start to lose confidence in the system and the currency itself. According to Zhang, this loss of confidence is the final stage of a financial collapse. Once the public realizes that their money is losing value at an accelerated rate, they will rush to spend it while it still has purchasing power. This behavior, in turn, will drive inflation even higher, creating a feedback loop that could spiral out of control. Zhang predicts that by 2025, the effects of this inflation will become obvious to the general public. While inflation has already eroded the purchasing power of many, the worst is yet to come. The Federal Reserve's inability to curb inflation without triggering deflation or a full-scale economic collapse will lead to a period of extreme financial instability. Zhang explains that while the Federal Reserve's actions have failed to stimulate the economy in any meaningful way since 1997, they have succeeded in one critical area, transferring wealth from the many to the few. As debt levels rise and inflation increases, the value of money declines, making it harder for average people to maintain their standard of living. Meanwhile, those at the top, who have access to assets that increase in value during inflationary periods, continue to grow richer. I, I believe that they're going to try and hold it steady through the elections, so not have a big crisis before then. But after that, I think all the gloves are pretty much off. And that's why I, and also I'm looking at the monetary velocity and the big spike there. And that's the number of times that money changes hands, which is indicative of, 
I mean, I, I could be wrong and I really hope I am, but I believe with all my heart and, and everything that I know that we've already begun the transition to hyperinflation and that there's only, there are a number of levels of confidence that have all since 2008 gone away. But that last level of confidence is public confidence in the system, in the currency. And when Powell lowers the rates, we're going to see more borrowing, more money printing, more inflation, because they have not killed that beast that they created and continue to create. And um, I think it'll become very obvious. 2025 is when I would think it would start to become very obvious to the public, because I think the inflation will spike. What becomes obvious? Uh, that we are entering a period of very high inflation. There is only one way to fight deflation, and that is with inflation. There's only one way to fight inflation, and that is with deflation. And so they were able to mm, balance that more when we had more purchasing power. But I have yet to meet anybody, and I, I talked to some quite brilliant people, and I've yet to talk to anybody that can tell me what happens when we get to zero. One of the most telling signs that we are entering a period of extreme financial instability, according to Zhang, is the shift in consumer behavior. People are already making sacrifices, trading down to cheaper goods, postponing purchases, and doing without non-essential items. This change isn't limited to the lower and middle classes. Even wealthy consumers are starting to cut back, with luxury goods manufacturers scaling back production in response to falling demand. Zhang points out that this shift in behavior is a direct result of rising inflation and declining purchasing power. As people struggle to make ends meet, they are forced to make tough choices about where and how they spend their money. This is exactly what happens in the early stages of a hyperinflationary crisis, when consumers rush to spend their money before it loses even more value. If you, if you, look, and if you look on that graph, what you see is that there was a period of time when taking on more debt actually did stimulate the economy. But that peaked in 97. And ever since then, no matter how much more debt we've taken on, it has certainly stimulated inflation and the loss of purchasing power, but it has not really been economically stimulative. It's been more transferative, right? The wealth has transferred from the many to the few. And so when you look at that graph, the, the times that money has changed hands basically has fallen off a cliff with a teeny blip here or a teeny blip there. So I've been watching that quite closely because once we go into a level where now the public is really starting to get rid of the money because they're recognizing the rapid inflation and they want to use that money when it has more purchasing power. So that's exactly what happens in a hyperinflationary state when somebody knows that the value, their purchasing power value is evaporating rapidly, they get rid of those dollars or euros or, or whatever, Argentine pesos, or I mean, there's a whole bunch of currencies here because that's when they start to recognize that loss of value. If they can keep it at that 2% like they talk about, people don't notice it and they don't change behavior. But behavior has changed. It's changed already. People are trading down. People are doing without. People are postponing purchases. And we're not just talking about the low end consumer or even the middle end consumer, we're also seeing this kind of behavior, not as great as the lower end, but even in the upper end, they're, you know, watches, they're making fewer high end watches and, and different things because even the higher end consumer mm -hmm. is starting to have to make some choices. Mm -hmm.